from Los Angeles. This is the Echelon Radio Network. So this is Jerry Hemsworth with the Echelon Radio Podcast. And we were just laughing here with Dr. Robert Snyderman. Hi, Bob. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm great. We were just laughing about timepieces. So you're wearing, you're, you're fashioning a, a very lovely piece. Thank you. What, what watch is that? It's called a Frank Mueller. Frank. Frank. It's German, but it's actually it's, Genevan. It's, it's Swiss. <laughs> it's Swiss, but I think the guy's name is German. Frank. And it's called the Frank Mueller. Long Island, which is a very large face because I have very large hands and wrist, so it fits on my wrist. And, oh, so um, you don't wear puny pieces? I don't wear puny pieces. Puny pieces look like make me look fat. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that because I'm wearing a rather large new piece that I got. I I I did I did foot the bill for a new Apple Watch. Yes, I like Apple Watches. And um, and I got the 38 millimeter one. But okay. my very best favorite watch is one I bought in London, a Camden watch. Huh. Um, and, Not familiar um, with that. It's They aren't expensive, but they are very, very nice pieces to wear. Uh, fashion. 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 Yeah. But it's, it is rose gold. But you say... This piece is rose gold, but it looks like an 18 karat gold watch. Yes, it, it does. Um, and I can't really tell until you put it next to a yellow uh, gold watch. Then, then you're and right. I actually prefer white gold over really? other color golds, but I love this watch. This is, this is a watch I asked. I have a friend of mine who is a watch dealer. Yeah. And he doesn't generally have these kinds of watches. He does mostly... Um, Cartier and Rolex is his specialty. Okay, um, and he has a shop in Melrose, and it's a great little shop. And he's very well, he's very well versed in watches. And I told him what I wanted, uh -huh. and he found it for me. How long did it take for him to find? It was very fast. It, um, I was surprised. It took him about six months. I didn't know he was looking. That's fast. I didn't know he was looking. Wow. Um, and he, there was a pawn shop around the corner of his, around the corner from his shop, mm -hmm. that had a Frank Mueller, and he said, "Meet me over there." So I drove over there, and it wasn't the Long Island; it was a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. and it was a really good price. Mm -hmm. He looked at it and said it was in really good shape, and I said, "Okay, I think I'll buy it." And he said, "I don't want you to buy this one." Really? He, out, Why? Outside the door, he said. He says, no, no, no. He says, I don't think you're going to be happy with it over a long term. I think it's too really? small for your wrist, and I just don't think you're going to be happy with it. And I said, okay. He said, I'll find you one. And about a month later, he was, in a, he was at a watch show in Las Vegas, uh -huh. and he texted me. He put it on. He put this watch on, yes. and he took a picture of it, and he texted me. He says, what I, like, do you think? I like this watch. What do you think? I said, take it. And <laughs> he's a kidder. This guy's a kidder. And he says, uh, he <laughs> says on the plane back, I could have sold it four times. Oh. <laughs> you know, so, so he brought it back from, from Vegas, a Vegas show. Yeah. Um, got a good deal on it and gave me a good deal on it. And, and there it is. I had, it's got to be a very fascinating world because of the history of Right. As you say, timepieces. You said this gentleman says they're not watches. Right. This is not a watch. This is a timepiece. And and it's really, really cool. Thank you. You have a business called HR Focus. Yes. What does HR Focus do? Well, by the name, it kind of indicates that I do HR. Yes. And that's a component of what I do. But really... Yes. Really, I think it's a misnomer to some extent, but it gets me in the door. Really? It's really, what I do is I work with companies mm -hmm. um, and their people mm -hmm. to help them do better business in whatever way I can contribute. Mm 
mm-hmm. and in, a, in whatever way they prefer me to contribute. Mm-hmm. You know, so it could be an HR compliant issue. It could be a performance management issue. Um, it could be a leadership issue or a coaching issue. Any of those things. I conflict would, or conflict. A lot of conflict resolution. Managers yes. aren't getting along, or managers aren't getting along with their with their subordinates. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a discipline problem where they're not getting performance out of someone. They need someone to help them figure out a way to get better performance or to disengage. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are pretty straight. That, that kind of stuff is pretty straightforward, HR. Yes. But the stuff that I do that's really not so straightforward mm-hmm. is uh, leadership stuff. Uh, I work with leadership teams. I do team building. Um, I do succession planning with mm-hmm. with teams. Right now, I've been on a project for about the last year, um, working with a company that is a nonprofit. It's actually a nonprofit mm-hmm. that is turning their entire, almost their entire leadership team over in the next, well, now two years, oh, the next wow. two years, because everybody there's there's nine people on the team, and I think. Uh, Six or seven of the people on the team are over the age of 60, and they're all talking retirement. And the CEO wants to retire um, and has identified January of 2023 as, her, as the retirement date. That's the exit date. And, um, and they have no bench strength. They, they, need, yes. they, they need to define who's going to be their leadership team going forward. And um, so I've been working on that. So that's really not HR, but right. it's people. Sure. You know, it's people. And, and, uh, or human capital, as they human say capital. these days. That's right. And there's a lot of developmental programs that have to be put in place. Yes. So, the, so the people that are identified as up-and-comers or people who are identified as coming, coming on to the leadership yes. team yes. Um, will be properly prepared so they can step into the jobs. I mean, one example is uh, in the process, their IT manager, who's just, I mean, it's not fair, that's not, that's not yeah. fair, not a just, but, <laughs> but, but he's an IT manager, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And we interviewed him and, and we said, um, you know, IT is becoming really important, a much more important position today oh, and boy, going howdy. forward in the future. Yes. On everybody's company, yes. all companies. Yes. And, and I said to him, are you capable of being a CTO? I, I don't know. Right. I mean, right. I don't know what a CTO looks like. Right. Right. Because I don't have the subject matter expertise. So mm-hmm. I was talking to him and I, I worked on and off with this guy for a long time mm-hmm. and, um, I didn't have a particularly impressive point of view of him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I found this guy, we were having this conversation, and I found this guy incredibly candid. Really? And I was surprised. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, I would like to be a CTO, but I'm not there yet. Oh, interesting. I'm not capable of being a CTO for this company. Sounds right very now. self-aware. Yes, and and shocking to me, surprising uh-huh, to me. Uh-huh. So, um, I put my head together with my partner that was working with me on this project, and uh-huh. we sat down with the CEO, and we said, you know, this guy, he might be the person you need going forward. Uh-huh. I just don't know. And I would suggest that you hire a consultant. Mm who's well-versed in IT, Mm -hmm. that can evaluate Mm -hmm. his capability of becoming a CTO and maybe mentor him and coach him. Yeah, get him there. So that's what they did. Especially if he wants to become that. That's right. If that's his ultimate goal. That's right. So I referred someone in to the company Mm -hmm. to first evaluate the guy's capability Mm -hmm. So from from a point of view of someone who consults as a CTO, so he's pretty high level. And... um, and then design a coaching program for him that's to become the CTO cool. of the future. So, yeah, so I, I'm doing that kind of work, and yeah. that's really fun work for me. You like that's that? That's really fun work for me, yeah. And you also do expert witness work, right? I do a lot of expert witness work, and I do a lot of investigations. Uh, um, do you I, like that? I do. Uh-huh. I do. The investigations um, are very uh, procedural, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but... You know, you're helping companies resolve huge issues. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and 
sometimes it's a little painful and sometimes, you know, but it's necessary to, you know, I feel like I'm making a contribution to the mm -hmm. organization long term in the organization by doing a good investigation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the results can be kind of painful. Mm -hmm. um, I bet. And sometimes they're not, but sometimes they're painful. Oh, yeah. Um, difficult it, conversations sometimes. Very difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And very difficult conversations for board of directors to mm -hmm. have to confront mm -hmm. something that's not, that's not working well in the mm -hmm. organization. Or a leader that has made some terrible mistakes and there's a consequence and they've done a good job except. Yes. Yes. And and then they're faced with this concept of do is the exception acceptable mm -hmm. or is it not? You know, and, and lots of times, you know, that's not my that's not not my call. You know, I just give them the results. They have to decide whether it's whether they act on it or not. Yeah, you know, oh, I'm God. just thinking. on the expert witness work stuff. Um, it's court. It's it's, <laughs> it's just court. You know, it's. <laughs> It's a really strange animal, yes. uh, of which not We've being a done, lawyer. Uh, Brian has done some of it, too. Right. And, you know, my point of view on expert witness work is um, I evaluate the case. I, I say what, I've, what my opinions are, mm -hmm. and uh, they fall where they fall. And, you know, there, there's a lot of times I feel like on expert witness, you have to be really honest with your client mm -hmm. because sometimes you can't agree with them you know i've had a lot of clients where i've evaluated the case and i've said uh i don't think you want me to testify in this case because i don't think it's going to work for you wow. and they'll say why lots of times on defense side which is interesting because yeah. a lot of the work i do in expert witnesses is, is disability um, yes. related because yes, i have yes. a specialty in disability and um and so lots of times defense attorneys will contact me and ask me to evaluate the case not really knowing whether i'm actually going to testify or not but they want to know what i think the holes are interesting and so i can say to them well you have a hole here where you are have they going to get clobbered that's right where are we going to get clobbered and can we handle it and mm -hmm. and often they'll say yeah i knew that I, I'm glad yeah, you brought and you're this like, up. Well, I knew that. I think we can handle that issue. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, the, especially on disability cases, it's really, really difficult for the employer mm -hmm. to do everything correctly. Yeah, it's yeah. The, just it's it's almost impossible. And so there there are always things that the employer could have done differently, and and then it becomes an issue of can we overcome that in the case or can we not? You know. Wow. Well, Bob, what? How did you get to specialize in disability? Well, that's actually a, a it's actually a long story, but I'll I'll make it a short story. I have a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling. Okay. And so I worked with um, so rehabilitation counseling is basically vocational counseling mm -hmm. for people who are disabled. Okay. Okay. So okay. that's the that's the rub. It's not just straight. Counsel, yeah. uh, career yeah. counseling. It's career counseling for people that have a disability of some kind. Understood. The area that I worked in was the workers' comp system. So I had a, I had a company, uh, a rehabilitation consulting company, when we worked with uh, insurance companies who were required to provide uh, return-to-work services mm -hmm. as part of the law in California mm -hmm. until um, 2004. Okay. Right. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2004, I think the law changed. Mm -hmm. I might be a little off on that. Um, and so I ran this, uh, my partner and I ran a company, and we worked with people who are disabled mm -hmm. due to workers' comp or long-term disability was another type of case we worked with. And so these are all disabled people that are, cannot do their jobs anymore, and now they need to be either retrained, retrained or sure. redirected into a different job. So. Yes. You know, all of the disability issues involved in returning someone to work is my specialty. And then the ADA, and then the ADA came along mm -hmm. um, in the middle of, you know, I started my company in 1982, mm -hmm. and the ADA was passed in uh, 1989 and was implemented in 1992. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, we were involved in the, AD, the implementation of the ADA especially in California. And then I left the industry. Hmm. 
Because Why? the legislation, the California legislature, when when Schwarzenegger came in, which yes. is, I think was two thousand four, that when he okay. came in after Gray Davis. Mm-hmm. Uh, they changed the workers' comp law, and mandatory rehabilitation no longer existed. Oh, gotcha. So it put a lot of the rehab counselors out of business. I was already out of the business at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. I saw it coming. I was I was very active um, in the community in California, mm-hmm. the professional community in California. I saw it coming. That's why I went back to school and got my PhD. Gotcha. And so by the time Schwarzenegger came into office, I was already you out of the that. industry, mm-hmm. you know. But I st- always consulted with companies for um, reasonable accommodations, interactive process, things it like that. A passion as, of as yours. part of my consulting practice. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how I inadvertently ended up going back into expert witness work because okay. I've stayed in, I've stayed in the disability, um, working with disability issues in workplaces mm-hmm. through my clients. And then it became um, kind of a easy step to go into expert witness work because of my expertise. So it sounds like you were very had a lot of insight or foresight to to recognize a direction that you needed to start going in. Where did you go? To, where did you get your PhD from? I got my PhD from California School of Professional Psychology. It's uh-huh. an organizational psychology degree. Sure. My daughter just graduated from CSPP oh, on the clinical side. Gotcha. Um, so CSPP had a clinical program and and an organizational program. I was in the organizational program. Gotcha. Um, and um, it's kind of interesting, just, just an aside. So business schools have organizational behavior programs. And so yes. you... If you're going to go to a, if you're going to get a PhD from a, from a business school, yes. it's usually called organizational behavior. And if you're getting a a, a PhD from a um, uh, from a school of psychology, it's yes. called organizational psychology. So it's ah. it's very similar training, but it's different orientation um, in terms of the approach to the to to the practice. Interesting, interesting. So. I'm going to switch gears. Where did you grow up? I grew up in West L.A. West L.A. Mar were you Vista. born? You were born. There? I was born at Cedars of Lebanon, which mm-hmm. every Jewish kid in <laughs> in Los Angeles was born at Cedars of Lebanon, <laughs> except my wife. My wife was born at St. Joseph's, so it's just kind of funny. Okay, <laughs> she's a Valley girl. She's a Valley girl, right? Um, and I grew up in Mar Vista. My parents mm-hmm. lived at the same house in Mar Vista. Well, it's now called Mar Vista. It was called West LA at the time. Yes. My parents lived in the house for 60 years. Wow. Um, so I grew up in that house. Uh, my brother still lives about a mile from that house. My sister's deceased. I went to Venice High School. I went to Webster Junior High School, which is Webster. off of National and Sawtell. Okay. Um, and then I went to Venice High School. And, wow. and then UCLA. Why UCLA? Just because or family thing no none of those <laughs> you know it's really you, you know i haven't been asked that question for a long time i was my my friends were very academically oriented much mm-hmm. more academically oriented than i was um were you sports oriented I don't know what I was. Or just you know, yeah, I played gagging. tennis. I played tennis in <laughs> high school, and I was successful playing tennis in high school. But I ended up having shoulder problems. Um, but um, you know, my friends were going to universities. Uh-huh. My my brother and my sister went to San Fernando Valley State, uh, <laughs> which is now AKA Northridge. Northridge. My yeah. sister actually, before she graduated, it became Northridge. And so they were going to state schools, and I was thinking, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of friends that applied to UCLA. I qualified. Mm-hmm. My GPA by itself qualified, and so I applied to UCLA. It was not as difficult as it is today to get no, in. No, now it's. And yeah. Ended up going. I ended up getting getting into UCLA. I, I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, it's local. I, I mm-hmm. lived near campus. I didn't live on campus. but I lived And you didn't there. live with your parents? I didn't live with my parents, no. though. And, um, and my parents didn't have money, so I paid for it myself. I had a job. I got a job in my freshman year. What did you do? I was working as a dishwasher in a lab, in a, oh. in the, in a neurological research lab. That sounds stimulating. So, it was it was fun being a dishwasher, uh, 
but but it, it was a neuro, not, not neurological kind of, lab <laughs> but not the kind of dishes that you think about yeah um and um and over the years i became a lab tech i also always did the dishes but i became a lab tech in the and so i worked there all the way through my undergraduate degree which was five years uh-huh. and a year after i graduated um it was a and great what was job. your degree Huh? And your degree was in, in biology. Bio- really? My, my undergraduate degree is in biology. Okay. And, um, and you know, it was a great, I mean, all my friends are doctors. Yeah. You know. Well, so are you. Well, yeah, but they're medical doctors. They're medical they're, doctors. They're medical. As a matter of they're fact, MDs. My, my general practitioner, my internist, is a guy that I went to undergraduate school with. Is uh, that weird? No. To, to like, it's not weird at all. It, you know. I, I think I was in a meeting where we had this discussion where is it weird when your doctors are your friends and they, they know more about you yeah. than other people would? Um, in this case, no, it's very comfortable. Okay. It's very comfortable. All right. Um, but, but, you know, I, 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 we were friends. We were yeah. friends and we're yeah. still friends. And, um, and, you know, it's really funny because I have now since met uh, five or six people that go to him, and it's kind of weird. Wow, yeah. wow. it's a little weird. But, and and recently during the pandemic, actually, a friend of mine who I was in, uh, he had the largest bill. He broke a lot of glassware in our organic chemistry lab, <laughs> and and he had the largest bill I ever heard of because he broke in so organic you chemistry. Billed. You've got expensive glassware. So he, and he got billed. For- he got billed for breaking a lot of glass unintentionally, but he still got billed okay. for it. And he went to medical school, and he's now an ophthalmologist. So no. you can imagine. <laughs> he's now an ophthalmologist. Glass he, is he, big for him. He, 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 that's right. He, he 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 says he specializes in the left eyelid, but actually, he's he's actually far more important than that. He's he's a um, he's an ocular re, he reconstructs. Um, ocular, oh. the, so the socket for the eye, um, usually because of either trauma or mm. or cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and he came out to Los Angeles to visit his kids, um, his daughter, mm-hmm. uh, and his grandkids in the middle of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And he called me, and we we had drinks together. It was really oh, nice. that's cool. And um, you know, so I hadn't seen him uh, probably for fifteen years. Uh-huh. I mean, it's been. 30 or 35 years since he moved away and he's okay. in the Midwest. But um, but periodically I would see him when he came into town. But uh, this is the first time I've seen him in like 15 years. It was in the middle of the pandemic. But he was he was vaccinated before I was. So uh, <laughs> Well, I just learned something about you too, and that is you're a huge Dodger fan. We have, we yes. have a lot of members that are Dodger fans. Yeah. When did you, do you remember the first game you ever went to? Or how you became such a huge Dodger fan? Yeah. Um, well, my father was a big Dodger fan. Uh-huh. And I used to I used to listen to the Dodgers all the time. We didn't go to a lot of games, but I went to uh-huh. a game when they were in the Coliseum. So I was really, really? young. Really? I was really young. Okay. But I, the season that I remember was 63. Okay. When Sandy Colfax and Don Drysdale. And my sister had a friend who knew Sandy Colfax. Really? So she could get us into the games. And so I, I think that we went to like four or five games um, that year in 63. Wow. And, um, you know, so Sandy Colfax and, and you know, it dates me a little bit. Sandy Colfax and Don Drysdale and um, Johnny Padres mm-hmm. and Ron Paranowski. I mean, these, these wow. really um, second-generation second Dodgers that yes. you hear about a lot yes. about. Duke Snyder was at the end of his career. Wally Moon was on, you know. Wow, I went to a gosh. game uh, at the Coliseum where, you know, Wally Moon was really uh-huh. well-known for the moon shots. Yeah. Um, so I've been a Dodger fan all that time, and now, now we go to a lot of games now. How many would you say you go to in a season? <clears throat> You should go to at least 10, 10 a season. Wow. Yeah. And recently, I mean, I thought I would never, ever have a chance to go to a World Series game. And um, I was able to go to the first game of the World Series. This is the first time the Dodgers won the World Series, I think, 17, 2017. Okay. And it was the first time 
the Dodgers had a home World Series game, and I was at that first game, and it was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. and I figured, well, that's my bucket list. I'll never. Mm-hmm. I've been mm-hmm. to two World Series games since, mm-hmm. so so it's kind of fun. It's fun. And we were just talking that you actually have season tickets. I have I have a connection. A connection I'm a gr- too. I'm in a group. Gotcha. Of season tickets. So. So you know, it's really nice. My family, or all my family, is is uh, um, Dodger fans. Now it's a little bit more difficult because my son and my daughter are with people that are also Dodger fans. I only have the, the seats are only four seats, so we're going to have to figure out how we're going to do that. I yeah. think I'm going to I'm, I'm going to be aced out a couple times. Oh, <laughs> oh. Relegated to watching on television. What, really, yeah, and sending my kids with their with their significant others. So. Well, you, we were just watching a, a Dodger game the other day, and our daughter was at the game with friends, and we saw where she was sitting, and there was no question that we could see far better and far more on television than she could in the nosebleed seats way up in right field. Yeah. Do you ever go to a game and go, oh, we should just stay at home? Or is it, are you that much of a fan where you're like, well, if I was night. in the nosebleed seats, I'd probably say that. Yeah. But I, I have a good, I, I'm behind home plate in the load section. So I have a very good perspective on the field. The mm-hmm. one thing that I hate is mm-hmm. my eyesight sucks and I can't read the scoreboard very easily. Uh-oh. So I have to constantly asking my son, with, you know, what's on the scoreboard, and that kind of stuff, and he gets a little impatient with me. But, but he realizes I'm getting old. So, you know, so that's what I miss is because when you're sure. watching on television, sure. all the statistics are available to right. you. Right, that's the thing uh, is you get a little bit more. Right. It is, yeah, it's like going to the Rose Parade versus watching it on that's TV. That's right. But there's a feeling in Dodger Dodger Stadium. And people talk about Dodger Stadium as being just an amazing stadium. Yeah. It is. Yeah. There's a feeling when you're at the game yes. in Dodger Stadium that's very different and yes. it's kind of unique and um, it feels comfortable. Yes. And um, you know, it's worth the hassle to get in and out of the stadium, yes. and it's worth it to me. I mean, I went to the game last Tuesday, and and it was a reopening day, and and um, it was packed, and it was a million people. I mean, it was fifty two thousand people there. Oh wow! And first first day out of COVID, and it was so great. It was it was a great feel. And and um, when you know you're going to the game, are you all day looking forward to, to getting there? Well, or is it one, just yes. like, oh, yeah, nice, that's right, we're going to the game tonight? Or are you like the, a little kid going, this, we're going to the game? This we're is going the, to the first game. one. This was the first okay. one in a year and a half. Okay. So actually, I was surprised. My wife was really excited. Really? We were all really excited. Oh, we were like cool. little kids. Yeah. We were like little kids. And, and, um, my daughter was really excited. My son, it was the four of us that went. And uh, everybody was really excited because my my wife has become a real Dodger fan watching it on TV. Uh-huh, sure. You know, and... Me and, too. And so she's, uh, you know, she... Everybody was excited about going back. It was the first game in a year and a half. Well, and and you also have a, do- a neighbor that happens to be a uh, Actually... A player. Uh, a couple of the neighbors. A couple of your neighbors. Yeah, uh, Justin the... Turner lives two blocks from my house. No, Turner's and, there yeah, too. Yeah, but he's never out. I, I never see him. Um, Kershaw lives a little bit further out, but he, but we walk by his house when we walk on our door. We walk yeah. by his house almost every and you day. You say ciao. And he's actually sometimes he's out in front. He's mm-hmm. very friendly. He's nice. very friendly. He's a really nice guy. And Jock Peterson also lives in the neighborhood. We're, tr- we're trying to figure out if he actually moved. Well, he got he, traded, he right? He got traded to the, to the Chicago Cubs. Uh-huh. But the neighbors say that his, you know, his kids play with all the kids in the, you know. How do you uproot the kids? <laughs> right. And so I have a feeling, Jock's from California, so mm-hmm. uh, from Northern California. Yeah. I have a feeling he might not have sold his house, and that's, uh, you know, he's staying where he's staying. Commuting thing. You know, and, you, you know, he's with the, I think he's with the Cubs. Okay. Okay. So, so you know, when he's in when he's in Chicago, he probably has an apartment or something. He stays in, but I'm, I don't know what he's doing. But um, so Justin Turner is a local. Uh, Justin Turner grew I up didn't in California. That. Yeah. And, and oh. Kershaw, the day that season ends, yeah, he's back to Texas. He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. 
I mean, you kind of know. Yeah. You, you can see there's no he's cars. He's a Texas that didn't, native, right? Yeah, he's yeah. a Texas native. He grew up in he grew up in the backyard of yeah. of yeah. Uh, the Ranger Stadium. Uh, well, I remember during the the um, World Series, they right. were talking about right. how strange it was. He for lived him. like 15 minutes from yeah. the park. Yeah, and he grew up there, you know. So, yeah. but I think he really likes Los Angeles. Yeah. I think he okay. he's been treated really well by Los Angeles. I think yes. he likes Los Angeles. But you know, his home is he's a family guy. His home is his yes. Home. There's always uh, Texas license plates all over his front yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got three or four cars out in front that you know I, parking you know, on the grass or what <laughs> he doesn't have grass in front. well he has grass but but you know his wow uh, you are his you parkway, are a looky loo his parkway you? is a gravel <laughs> is gravel <laughs> oh bob thank you for being with uh, me today thank you for having me oh. this has been fun oh this has been fun come back i will okay all right thanks Presented by Echelon Business Development. More than just networking. Way more.